Hey everybody, I'm Dave Womack. And I'm Jamie Womack. And we are from Bird Tricks. And today's video is about recovering lost birds. Now we hope you never need the information in this video, but unfortunately, especially this week, it's kind of been the African gray week of losing birds, which we can relate to, luckily not as traumatic as the stories we've heard this week. However, we did lose our African gray Cressy for about four hours, and we learned a lot from the experience that we want to share here in this video so that, like us, you have a happy ending too if your bird happens to get out. Just in the last week alone, three different greys had three different stories. The first one, lost for good. The second one, 50-50 chance of recovery. The third one, came back within just a few minutes. The reason I point that out is that I want to be able to have you best prepared for all the multitude of things that can happen. But first and foremost, when the worst happens, your bird gets loose, you might hear me say relax a lot. And what I mean is to remove your emotion. The best you can remove your emotion, the better chance you have of thinking logically and clearly and finding your bird. And this I'll be the first to say that that is easier said than done. So if you can't do it, find somebody <laughs> who can do it. Um, because in a lot of our situations, I've been that person who has been all over those three things, whereas I immediately saw a bird fly out and I'm like, she's gone, never gonna see her again. I gave up immediately, my mindset was wrong. Two, I panic really easily, so there's a lot of hobbies I don't have. Um, <laughs> and three, Dave has always been the one to have a more logical mind and thinking process and been able to see us through and right out of it. And a great tip to be able to help you with that is I want you guys to pretend that anytime your bird's lost, you're helping us recover our bird. Remove your emotion and just know you will be mourning, you will be sad, you'll be going through a mix of emotions, but right now we need you to focus and it's okay but we need you to think logically. So those are the big beginning tips. Yeah, and I think that's probably the most beneficial piece of advice is to stop looking at it as your prized possession and your baby being lost out there and think about it from a different emotional standpoint of I'm helping a friend find their bird. That new perspective will really help you think more logically and more effectively and more efficiently. So let's get started. <laughs> So first, let's start this video with what happened to us and our illogical thinking and our freaking out and how it led us to logical thinking. Well, first of all, you should take the free flight course. <laughs> Second of all, you should take <laughs> the free flight course. What happened is we were free flying in a valley and we didn't think of it as much of a valley, but the bird went up and over the hill and we never saw Cressy. For the rest of the day, we spent four hours looking for her and we had little uh, radios that tracked our GPS coordination everywhere we walked. We logged miles looking for this bird. After four hours, we were in the same spot that many of you would be in in that same situation. We felt defeated. We didn't know the what ifs, what should we do? And there wasn't this kind of information out there. And it wasn't until we sat down at the last moment that we saw her and I said, okay, whew, let's be logical. What happened? The facts were we flew her from here the next fact was she went that way, and then we didn't see her right after she went over the hill. So we walked up, went over the hill, and picked her up. She was there the whole time. With we a pile just of poop. Couldn't see her. Waiting. So once we were able to remove that emotion and just think logically, we had a lot of success. And that is our first and foremost major tip for this course is just to help you understand that the sooner you can take that emotion aside and relax, the better chance you have of finding your parrot quickly. And it's important to note that there's a very small window of opportunity that closes with each passing hour. So if you have to spend too much time looking, you're decreasing the odds of finding your bird. So again, the faster you move that emotion, the faster you can recover your bird. So to begin, we want you to be able to look through and avoid losing your bird checklist. And the first point is don't give up too soon. The reason I say that is of the three African gray scenarios that happened in one week, we had one of the groups gave up within the first hour. And unfortunately, 24 hours later is when they put in the effort and that they really miss that window of opportunity. The second scenario, it's three, four days later and they've still got a bigger search party looking. And the final scenario, they found the bird. They never lost the bird, he just got out. They called him back, he flew back because he did some flight training. So don't give up too soon. Was that me? Yes. So the next part of the checklist is, is your bird legally identifiable? This means does it have a leg band number unique to your bird or is it microchipped, which we try to do with all of our birds. 
Another thing that I see a lot of our free flight students do is they actually order a custom leg band with their name and phone number that says, if found, call me. So that's another option you could do, even if you don't plan on free flying. <laughs> I'm giving them your number. Sorry, just, <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Next, is your bird desensitized to being outdoors and not easily spooked? This is usually achieved by giving your bird time outside in a safe way. So that could be on a harness, if that's something you believe in. It could be in an aviary, or it could be in a carrier. But the idea here is that the bird's first time outside, it's going to be terrified of all these new scary things. So let's not have the first time it's outside be when it accidentally escapes. Next is, is your bird fully flighted? So just a tip here, because a lot of people don't believe this, but clipped birds are actually more vulnerable as they have less control over their direction. So you have to remember that if your clipped bird gets away from you into an area that you can't get to it and it can't make it back to you, it does have a severe vulnerability of being not able to fly that great. And the things that can get to it before you can are pretty terrifying. We hear a lot of stories of clipped birds that actually weren't allowed to fly and they couldn't fly because the owners before us said they couldn't fly and they flew so it does happen especially if there's any amount of wind and the dangers are if you live near water or an airport or an other area that is deemed unrecoverable there's really not much that you can do Next is if your bird is 95% responsive to recall training. This is a huge biggie one for us. It was something that we worked on. We work on with all of our birds, but I specifically put some work into it with our budgie because a lot of people don't do it with small birds. Um, but recall is basically getting your bird to come to you when you call its name. And it's something that is incredibly important, especially, well, not even especially, just for all birds. It's just important. Especially if you have a bird. <laughs> So next is, is your bird's enclosure secure? Meaning the door latches, the food dishes, the padlocks. Do you have a padlock on it? When we were in Coney Island, New York, in Brooklyn specifically, we had our birds in an aviary and Jinx picked the padlock, our blue-throated macaw, and he flew around New York for, we have no idea how long, but fortunately our training was in place. So when he saw us, we saw him, we gave him a call, he came right down and now we put two padlocks on. Which brings us to our next point. Can you safely take your parrot in and out of an aviary? A huge hint here, please use a travel carrier. There's been so many situations that have been avoidable fly-offs. Most of them end out okay, but there's been many situations where if you don't use a travel cage and that bird does get loose, unless you have all the proper training leading into that, it doesn't always go well. And I will say, because we didn't mention it before, but a catch-all <laughs> is very helpful. Um, so a lot of aviaries don't necessarily come with catch-alls. We actually add, added one kind of manually from another aviary, like some parts we had, and it has been a game changer for us. And so many times, I can't even quote how many times we've been like, whoo, thank <laughs> goodness we have that catch-all. So really consider that because even trying to get a, a travel cage into an aviary sometimes, sometimes it like doesn't work out so great. And if you're not familiar, a catch-all is just simply a second set of doors prior to going in. So you open one, close it behind you, then you open the bird's main aviary. If a catch-all is not an option for you, the next best thing you can do is buy a bunch of stainless steel chains and hang them just inside the door. What this does is allows you to open the door and there's still a perceived barrier by your bird. Then you can close the door as you push through the chains and lock the door behind you. This will prevent your birds from making a beeline out of that opening and maybe it saved us once or twice. <laughs> or five million times. All right, so the other part is, is everybody in your house careful about open doors, windows, or other likely accidents, which unfortunately we have experience in this as well. Not like our photographer left the door open and Blueberry got out, but yeah. our free flight students were all there and they all acted in accordance to how we trained them and they all dispersed and the whole event only lasted four minutes and we got Blueberry back, who otherwise wasn't trained for free flight, but we did do recall training but it felt like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to this one, and that is, is your bird trained to touch the end of a stick? Or in other words, is your bird target trained? This has been something where as a magician, we use misdirection to guide your attention to something so we can make the magic happen. This is the same thing for parrots. We want to mentally misdirect your bird's mind in the event that it happens to get at the top of an 80 foot tree. Now you can imagine the bird's perspective. I'm in an 80 foot tree. I've never been this high up. I don't know how to get down out of here. There's people screaming at me. I don't know what's happening. Ooh, stick, I can touch a stick. 
and they figure out how to climb down the tree to touch the stick because they are so conditioned to do that well, you're able to mentally misdirect all that fear and guide it all into a behavior that they know how to do very well. We've helped countless people recover their birds this way, and it's one of the most simple and effective things you can do just in the daily routine and maintenance of your pet parrot. Our pet parrots don't have great eyesight at night compared to predatory birds like owls. So this makes them vulnerable, so they will instinctively roost for the night when it's dark. Which means once a bird has landed in the dark or just before it gets dark, it'll usually stay in place until dawn. So your efforts are best used to get some sleep while it's dark and be ready just before light so you can be the first noise your bird hears in the morning and the first thing it sees as well. If you have other pet birds in your home, bring one in a carrier to help you make contact calls and let your lost bird know where you are. Also, bring food and water to entice your bird to a healthy meal after such a stressful event. The sound of pellets or treats going into a dish will likely get your bird's attention and has worked for numerous people. A lot of people make the mistake here of thinking that they have to stay out and camp with their bird, but the better use of that time is to go back and again, focus on trying to remove your emotion and think about it logically. Use that time to be able to have you and your team, your family members, go through our download at birdtrickstore.com and you can go to our freebie section and download the Recovering the Lost Bird PDF. And that free download gives you a couple of different options of posters, different ideas on how to go ahead and get other people's attention, maybe offering rewards, lots of things that we're covering here, but you can get to work on the paperwork side of things so that you can go to bed early and wake up really fresh especially gives you time to kind of come up with a plan and like we talked about earlier, calm your emotions down. So again, if you need a link to that download, it'll be in this video's description. It's also really important to note that when you do go back in the morning to recover your bird, if you look up online, sunrise might be 6.30 a.m. Well, keep in mind that the light starts to peak a half hour before the published sunrise. So the sun might start to peak then, or light might start to come in at 6 a.m., so I'd, I'd suggest getting there an hour before sunrise, so we'd be there at 5.30 a.m. It's really important that as that window of opportunity closes, you are the first thing that your bird sees in the morning. It's also really important to not try to chase after your bird after he's been sitting up in the tree and it's starting to get dark. The reason for that is, well, they can't see well. So imagine these creepy little hands coming at it and they can't see well enough to know if it's you or your neighbor or somebody it's never met or a hawk and it might take flight and fly into the dark abyss never to be seen again. Wow. Might, might be a little okay. dramatic, but if you put a ladder up in the tree and you're trying to get this bird out of the tree, just doing that alone could further spook it. And now you're at an even greater disadvantage because you have an, an afraid bird who's flying in the dark. Now he's risking injury and you have no idea what direction he went. So again, sit back, try to remove that emotion and focus on recovering the bird early in the morning. The next scenario, of course, is what if you lose your bird during the day? So number one on this is always keep someone at the location your bird first flew and left from. So if your bird flew out of your house window, make sure somebody stays back home and waits in case the bird returns to that spot that it first left. Birds oftentimes find their way back to the first place they were lost from, and you want to have someone there if that happens. Births. I don't know why that was so hard to say, but you guys get it, right? <laughs> When a bird first gets outside, it's usually done out of fear, which means that the bird is probably acting in panic mode. So keeping constant vocal contact makes it a lot easier for your bird to know where you are without having to search. So make sure that you contact call like Marco. Polo. Polo. Hey, oh, well, we there's were two of us calling. here. <laughs> With your birds, so you can both be aware where each other is. So you can do this yourself. You can also use it like we talked about with another bird where your macaw might be contact calling back and forth or any other bird that you have in your house might be a good way to also keep in touch. Yeah, and you can do this with having your bird that didn't escape in a travel carrier so that it just knows to call back and forth with that bird because lo and behold, you'll get tired of calling for sure. <laughs> now, this is really important. Try to keep eyes on your bird by following which direction it's headed based on wind speed and direction, as well as how fatigued your bird is appearing. So if your bird doesn't have very good stamina, it's going to act different than a bird that has great stamina. Also on wind, keep in mind that more often than not, the bird will be in line with whatever direction the wind is going. For simplicity's sake, let's say the wind is blowing out of the north, going to the south. You are standing in the middle of that compass. 
if you fl are flying the bird or you see the bird and it happens to be going north into the wind, it's going to tire because it's going to try to turn out of the wind and be afraid and it's going to go back and they'll try to turn the other way to come around and it'll be too afraid to do that and it'll go back and eventually it'll just keep going into the wind and down. Generally, you'd find it in the nearest trees or buildings at the closest part of the perimeter from where you just lost your bird most of the time and it'll be in the direction that the wind was coming from or you look at the other way and it would be if the winds are from the north still and your bird took off to the south you want to pay attention to that flight pattern because what's going to happen is the wind is pushing the bird away so he's probably going to go further that direction than if he went into the wind but also he's going to naturally lose lift because he doesn't have picture flying a kite into the wind versus flying a kite out of the wind it's just going to crash it so there's no lift with the bird so it's going to go down faster and further and probably have a little harder impact in both cases the most common scenario to find a bird that's been lost when there's winds above five miles an hour is it directly in line with whatever the winds were at that time so I will say most stories we hear and most pet birds do not have the stamina to fly far unless it's windy and the wind is pushing them. Just because most people either clip or they don't really keep up on flight training and keeping flight of, flight of birds is more popular now than it was back in the day when we used to hear about this stuff. So this means that they're more likely within one mile initially and it'll help to get neighbors and passerbys involved with immediate search if they're willing. So call friends and family to help cover more ground. If you know that your bird has crap stamina and probably didn't make it that far. And that is the scientific definition. <laughs> I'm very scientific. <laughs> Another tip on this is that if your bird is flying away and you have 20-20 vision and it's a macaw, they look invisible under ideal situations at a quarter mile. Oftentimes we make the mistake of watching a bird go and we're like, oh, it's way out there and we'll go a mile to start the search but it's a tiny bird and at a quarter mile, that's when you really can't see it anymore. So generally they start going down because they're out of shape and you can't see them anymore and the last I saw them was there. That's generally where you're going to find them a quarter mile from where you started. Another tip with this is when you do see the bird go down, don't immediately run for it. I want you to picture gun sights. Now, the rear sights of a gun have two points, the front has one point. I want whoever is standing where you just were, so it should be you, have them come stand next to you, and I want you to picture gun sights and line up the trees with where you last saw the bird go down. This is really important because the person that is there that last saw the bird needs to not move. They need to reference those points, whether it's two trees and a telephone pole, whatever those sights are, Take a, I actually have taken pictures of this before to help people out and I'll zoom in to really help clarify what tree because once you're on the ground and you're up close, the terrain looks totally different. That one big tree you saw there, all of a sudden there's seven of them and you don't have the perspective. But if the person that last saw the bird can help line you up and direct you via radio or cell phone, it's going to help you a lot. <laughs>So let's say you go to where you last think you saw the bird where he just crashed and he's probably a quarter mile away or maybe less depending on the size of the bird and you get to that point and you don't see the bird anymore start setting up new quarter mile searches from each point of a new sighting so if you're in a neighborhood that might be that maybe your bird flew a mile and a half a neighbor calls says they found your bird go to their location and if you don't see them start another quarter mile in every direction so that you can start to canvas the area in a very methodical way without starting a mile out because it's going to feel incredibly overwhelming. I would say the other side of that is to have moments of quiet so that you can listen. Most likely your bird will be giving some sort of sign to you if it hears you and or sees you. It might be as little as a whistle. It might be really loud if you have a macaw or sun conure, um, but listen. So don't just be screaming your head off calling for your bird. Take a moment <laughs> to really listen and stop so that you aren't constantly hearing the noise of yourself. And for us, I would use words that our bird usually get set off by and that's probably when we say night night and we shut the doors uh -huh. they all are like screaming and saying night night and they're like no we're getting ditched <laughs> do things that will intentionally induce that sound because without getting that sound or elicit that sound I should say without getting that sound from them it's really hard to know where they might be so use those keywords that are typically triggers for them
A next tip that I like to share that's a little bit more technical is to help avoid overwhelm, take a look on, on line on a map or anything that basically shows an aerial view of your area. If you look at that alone, it's going to feel incredibly overwhelming. But if you take into consideration that maybe there was 10 miles an hour of wind and it was out of the north, well, remember what I was talking about with the wind? You're pretty sure the first places I would look would be a quarter mile to the north or a quarter mile to the south of where we last saw the bird, up and down that line of the direction of the wind. And then I would take a look at that map and I would start to cross off areas rather than thinking I've got an eight and a half sheet of, uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and we have to cover all of it, I would start to take a black Sharpie and cover, okay, the lake, let's cross out the entire lake because I physically can't recover a bird if it's in the lake. Let's cross off the international airport over here totally because I can't go in there for legal reasons. So the only areas now that I have to search get limited quite a bit. Or if there's any other areas that you just physically can't get onto for legal reasons initially, until you have permission, put those in a different color, but mark them off as, we'll come back to that, or mark it as, I, I physically can't get there, so I'm not even gonna let my mind be bothered by that. And that'll really help you pick what areas to look at first. Keep in mind that nature can be an incredible asset for you here. It could be ravens flying randomly at things that weren't flying before. It could be a hawk that all of a sudden is moving with interest. Take a look at all the little birds that are very possessive of their tree. How many times have we looked out the window while driving down the freeway and we see a hawk casually flying and little birds like, yeah, get out of here, ah, kick your butt. Look for those little birds. Those are going to be signs of any unnatural disturbances in the environment that there might be an intruder resting in their tree and that intruder might just be your bird. So it's very important to start to look for that type of thing. And especially in those situations, while the wild birds are tending to put a big ruckus on, your bird is likely to be silent during that because it's already upset wildlife by just being there. The last thing it wants to do is draw more attention to itself. So keep in mind, you should recognize those situations and just kind of go and investigate. Like in the case with Cressy, when we let our emotions override our logic for four hours, but then we thought logically and we found her. I joke you not, there was a pile of poop that big underneath her because there were hawks flying overhead. She did not move, she didn't make a sound, and it was probably because she was out of shape, which is why she crashed there in the first place. Again, super close in the line of the wind, but also because there are predators up ahead and she just wanted to be as still and quiet as she could and there was no cover where we were. So all very important things to think about. So parrots, although bright in color, maybe not the African greys, cam <laughs> camouflage very well into trees. So don't simply rely on their colors just to help them to stand out amongst them. So look for any movements in tree branches that could be your birds struggling for a spot. We've often heard our macaws breaking little branches when they're desperate to do a landing. Um, so keep that in mind that you can't just rely on the brightness of some of our birds to help you find them. You've got to listen to especially cockatoos. They land in the trees, and if you know anything about cockatoos in Australia, they destroy them. It's a great tip to find where it is when you start hearing little branches and bigger branches start to just fall out of the tree. This section is on all the things that you can do to exponentially increase your odds of success at recovering your bird, starting with alert the media. So have a press release ready to go that you can simply fill in the details on, copy and paste, and click to send to all the local media outlets, all your social media accounts, uh, Facebook, Google, all the things. A lot of people ask us, you know, how do I contact the media? And having done this for my professional career as a magician, it's actually a lot easier. They need stories, good ones and bad ones, happy ones and sad ones. So a great way to do it is go on to Facebook, go into uh, your local area, look for news, and then message them. They're usually very fast to reply. So make sure that you have your press release, some photos, and we're going to talk about a little bit, but is there a reward? Have all that stuff ready and reach out through all those networks that you can. Next, you want to alert your local vets, shops, and rescues. So make sure all animal rescues or bird stores or just animal stores in general, including animal vets, whether bird related or not, have been made aware of your missing parrot as people will turn a bird into any animal related place for help, including zoos. So you wanna make all animal rescues, sanctuaries, rehab centers, 
all of them aware that your bird is missing. It doesn't matter if they specialize or localize in just cats or dogs or hamsters. Tell everybody. Next, you want to post flyers online and locally. So don't get stuck in just the social media, not just, you know, your normal TV and radio media, but post them all over. This includes Craigslist, uh, Parrot 911? Yes. Parrot. <laughs> Parrot 911. Parrot 911. Um, but there's also a lot of local groups. For example, we live in a small town and there are tons of yard sale groups and things like that that I'm a part of for our local community that you can post in and they will gladly share that and get the word out among your local community. So images get shared and noticed more than text. So having a missing image file ready to go and grab people's attention is best for posting online in groups or on pages, as well as submitting in newspapers. If people can just share a simple image with all the text details in it, you're gonna be way better off than if they have to full on copy and paste and, and repost your original post. So make it as easy to share as possible. And think about this when placing your flyer, as much as I hate to say it, think about the demographics. And if you are offering a reward, which we do talk about a little bit more, consider the reward amount based on your demographic. Uh, somebody that I know that is looking for a parrot in a very well-to-do area, the reward may not mean much. So she put a lot of the posters in the less well-to-do areas, knowing that they would really rather have the $3,000 or whatever dollar amount you put for whatever bird it is, rather than keep this bird that might be expensive. So here's a few tips for your missing bird flyer. Like I said, offer a reward. This will be an incentive to get more people involved. And you might find that even the local construction crew is starting to look out for your bird. All these different people that are already outside from school bus drivers to you name it, all those people will become advocates for you because hey, they want to help you out and three grand doesn't hurt. I will say though, offering a reward does have its negative side of it too. There are a lot of scammers out there, so please be aware of that. And I think you had mentioned having somebody else kind of handle that side of things, just emotionally. I don't yeah, so I this tip it. came up actually right before filming this, I got a call and uh, it, was, it was from one of our clients whose bird got out. Um, it wasn't fully free flight trained, it did spook and she has been doing everything right. And she said, Dave, I don't even know when to, when to do this. There's, there's these scams coming out. There's, I, I need to be out here. What it came down to is she is the only one that that particular bird is most likely to come to. Maybe her and her husband, possibly her daughter, but really the number one's her. So she needs to be in the field looking for the bird. So I said, great, have your daughter go buy a GoDaddy phone number. There's probably a lot of other services out there that you can purchase a temporary number. And I said, have that forward to your daughter's phone, let her deal with all of the drama and the emotions and forward you the hot leads. That way, again, removing your emotion, the last thing you can do that's beneficial is be reading stuff where, hey, I got your bird, you know, text me this verification code or send me the money or I, I'll meet you. Uh, it's just, a, it's an emotional roller coaster that is avoidable through purchasing a temporary number and forwarding it to somebody on your team who's helping you recover your bird. So keep in mind, you can make your phone number prominent, but also make it where it can be removed later. So if you need to remove it, or if it's not exactly your number, like Dave said, I kind of feel like making that other number available is kind of the safer route to go. But ask people also to report any sightings and to that number. The challenge with this is if you have an African gray that we've been dealing with for three weeks, they've had lots of pigeon and dove searches because oh, no. they apparently look like they fly pretty similar to people that aren't around parrots. So it's a very understandable mistake. So be very aware of those sightings because people might give you bad info with good intentions. The next part of this is do not include your exact address. Simply offer the general area of which you feel like your bird was lost or needs to be returned to. This is just a safety thing. And for us, when we lived in Orlando and in our demo that we included in the download PDF, we just put the Waterford Lakes area in Orlando as a sample. That way, it actually put them several miles from where we used to live, uh, but it was far enough away that if they searched that area, they probably wouldn't hear our birds if we, you know, our other birds. You just really don't want them coming to your house and seeing that you might have other parrots and seeing dollar signs go off in their minds. Again, a lot of this depends on the area that you live, but take all that into consideration. 
Also, use a photo of your bird, not just the same species from Google Images. This will really personalize it and make it look less like a false advertising almost. If people don't believe it, they won't share it. So really share a photo that is genuinely yours and of your bird. Another option is to put together a video slideshow, whether it's pictures or video or a combination of both, that show your personal emotion with this parrot. So people start to connect with you and your connection with the bird and on a psychological level, they're gonna feel guilty taking that from you. They're gonna to wanna to help find that bird and give it to you versus find the bird and keep it for themselves because I've always wanted an African Grey. So be very careful about that. And that kind of brings me to never include identification information like the leg band number or the microchip number. So this is what the information that you're gonna to use to prove ownership and that you own that bird. So you never want to just put that out on flyers or give that out to anybody. So you can include things that would help a stranger entice your bird down, like really loves bananas or <laughs> something like that, where they would have an easier time getting your bird down from an area and be able to get it back to you. But don't include personal pertinent information like the leg band or the microchip. And it's also worth mentioning, you may not even want to bring up that it has a leg band on it because when you go recover this bird from somebody who may have found it and you agree to meet at Waterford Lakes, bring a local police on a non-emergency and have them be the liaison and your protection between that possible transaction. More than likely, they're gonna be on your side and let's be honest, they're working for us. So if they have an off-duty officer, awesome. If you have an on-duty officer, awesome. Do whatever you can to try to get a local authority to be there. This is going to do, a per it'll create a permanent record of that transaction and you can also show the officer, here's the information I have. Can you please confirm this is my bird or have that person prove that it isn't their bird? It just gives you a leg to stand on and it gives you a legal protection. I'm not a lawyer, but at least gives you a little bit more protection to keep yourself safe physically as well as legally. Although we hope the humans are just awesome and that you don't need any of that. <laughs> uh, plan for the worst, hope for the best, right? That's what they say. Next, you want to list any medical needs, even if they don't exist. This is actually an amazing technique. One of my clients is unfortunately going through right now where she said, yeah, I put, you know, needs medication because in her mind, she wanted to make sure that somebody wasn't keeping this bird thinking it was going to be this huge liability. And she actually had a few calls asking her, oh, what medication? And quickly she said, seizure medication, it's really expensive. So immediately if somebody's considering that they know somebody who may, knows somebody who maybe found the bird who's thinking about keeping it, that helps alleviate that wrongdoing. Uh, even though it might be bending the truth, uh, the medication might just be love. You don't have to tell them what kind it is. You just want to be able to get your bird back. So now let's jump forward to that amazing moment where you've got the call, you know where you're going, you show up and you found your bird, it's just 80 feet up in a tree. It's really important for you to understand that ascending is easier than descending. So when you ask your bird to fly back to you, make sure you're asking an easier flight that your bird is capable of. The closer you stand to the bird from below, the steeper the descent and the harder. So you don't want to be asking your bird to just drop straight down to you. <laughs> And I can relate to this as I'm actually learning how to fly airplanes right now. You can turn the engine off and you just pitch the plane. And what happens is you actually gain speed even though your engine's off. We noticed this firsthand with Blueberry. She's like, yeah, I got this. I'm outside. I'm a little nervous, but I'm going to come down to you. She tucked her wings in, still had a little bit of a coil there where air could, could go in. And she just shot past Jamie, full wings closed. And it was just a moment of like, okay, I come down to you and I go faster. And the problem is that scared birds continue to climb up until they get exhausted. They usually slam into that perimeter tree or buildings that I mentioned. And then when they try to come down, they don't know how to do that. And they just put on way too much speed and they don't know how to work those brakes yet. So definitely be, if you can be at the same height, ask for a level flight or really make that angle where it's not too far, but you're also not too steep of a, of a drop. I briefly mentioned this for the nighttime section, but it's just as important in the middle of the day. You want to make sure that you avoid continued fly-offs that are based on fear. So approaching your bird with scary objects like ladders, broom handles, anything that your bird is fearful of will only spook your bird into flight again. So try coaxing your bird to come to you instead. And that's again a perfect spot where you can use target training. Which brings us to the next part. <laughs> How to use target training or touch training to get your bird back 
And this is again a foundational training technique. So by training your bird to touch a target, which is usually done with a chopstick when we teach this to our birds and our clients, uh, you can distract your bird from its fear of being outside for the first time and ask it to do something that's not only familiar with, but confident doing. So instead of asking your bird to come out of a tree and fly to you in a panic, or even fly down to you in any way, you can simply target your bird down and out of a tree. We've had so many clients do this and get their birds back from being lost in trees outdoors. So never forget your foundational training techniques like this one. They come into play when you truly, truly need them. Which is why that point was worth making twice. This is again something that when you train a bird to touch a stick, it sounds like the stupidest trick in the world until you actually need it because your bird's stuck in a tree. So really, if you don't have that, if you don't know how to do it, you can check out our family friendly parrot formula course. It talks all about it. We also have several tips and tricks online with our YouTube videos, but those are at least just a couple resources for you. So some more tips to get the word out is by leaving flyers door to door in neighborhoods that your bird could be in. And it's a priceless thing that should be done more than once. So keep going back and putting those flyers up and maybe you'll get a different person at the door or you'll just be able to spread the news better. Consider putting flyers on cars, poles, public bulletins, shops, pet stores, restaurants, Ensure your flyer is taped into the window of your own car so you can also advertise your search when you're at the grocery store or wherever your errands take you. People will be able to see that and start to associate that, hey, I saw that poster, I saw that poster, this seems to be in my neighborhood, I want to help this person out. So keep in mind also that pet parrots associate humans with food and comfort, mostly, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so it's likely your bird will seek out a human for these things eventually. So make sure as many humans know as possible about your missing birds, so they know to contact you. And if you live somewhere that your species is also wild, make sure to contact wildlife rehabilitators so they will aid you in the lookout for what someone else might be thinking as a friendly wild bird. <laughs> Especially in areas like Australia. Wow, that galah is really friendly. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs>If you're considering doing free flight intentionally, uh, definitely reach out to us because we'd love to help you out. And one of the tools that we have been working very closely with, Marshall Radio and Telemetry, is uh, an ability to be able to track your bird without using a cell network. It actually uses either telemetry or GPS. So this is a great tool now available to parrot owners internationally, which is a pretty amazing. And we want you, we want to encourage you to look into the Marshall Radio GPS Bird Tricks package because although this device should not be relied upon instead of proper training, it's an invaluable tool for helping locate your free flighted bird as well as track mileage, flown, altitude, and speed. So you can track and improve upon your bird's stamina, flight skills, and patterns. So it can be used as a really valuable tool, but also in times of concern as well. So it's available on the Marshall Radio website online. You can check out birdtricksgps.com for all the details about how the package works. The Bird Tricks package exclusively comes with a dummy unit for you to train your bird to accept this thing, which is a whole thing in, a, in and of its own. So the Freestyle Flyers Club is in full support of our Marshall Radio collaboration with our Bird Tricks GPS package. <laughs>well that wraps up the general summary of all the ways that we can try to help you at least like this to be able to help recover your lost bird as you can imagine each scenario is going to require knowledge and background experience where you can dive a lot deeper into all the possible solutions all the possible failure points how to work through that and we just want you to know that we'd be a source if you guys need more help feel free to reach out to us at info at birdtricks.com and possibly even consider setting up a consultation or work with us on the free flight course so that you can actually do this on purpose. We've had several people where they've had their birds get out and they end up coming back to us to take the course as a preventative tool who never actually intend to free fly their birds again. Like with uh, Connie Hi, and Vic. Vic and Tika, the blue-throated macaw. I believe my numbers are getting warped over the years here, but I believe they found it five days later, 40 miles away at the edge of a nature preserve. So like we said in the beginning, don't give up. This bird lasted five days in the wild, and if it went in the nature preserve, they, that was that area in the map that's all blacked out, you can't get into. So they really, really got lucky, and they were playing all these tools into play. They did press releases, they got on local media, they got flyers out, there is videos of them showing the, their emotional relationship with this bird. They did everything right, and then came to us and said, whew, we don't want to go through that again. And they went through the Freestyle Flyers course, 
and all their friends thought they were nuts who helped them recover the bird. They're like, wait, you just lost your bird and now you wanna do it on purpose? And then they showed them pictures and videos from the trip and people understood why. It was pretty amazing. So if this video has helped you, hopefully it has, or it's helped a friend of yours that you have shared it with, please leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more bird tricks tips. You can do this one. Okay. Another great point about this is parrots, I need although- a little more silence between three. Mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, that didn't help, Ryan. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>